They say, the harder the work, the greater the reward. This is our life's work. Good morning. It's November 9th at 9.35 a.m. And this is another edition of the TDN Writers Room. I'm your host, Bill Finley. Thanks for joining us again. Well, Zoe, Randy, gee, where should we start, huh? Yeah, uh, let me think. How about flight life? And Zoe, don't play that drinking game again because the over on on how many times we say flight line on this podcast is going to be about 200. And I don't want to see you have to take 200 shots of anything, okay? Yeah, but, but I'm, I'm not drinking in the morning. I'm in England and it's 2.30 in the afternoon. So, I mean, I, I can drink whenever I want. I'm on holiday. Good for you. Well, you can have when the podcast is over, you can gladly have some drinks. <laughs> the TDN Riders Room is brought to you by Keeneland. Returning this November, Keeneland will offer a single session dedicated to racehorses on the final day of the sale, which is November 17th. Flightline left me speechless, but now being speechless wouldn't be good for a podcast now, would it? So, you know, we're going to talk about all aspects of his race. It was just, I, I mean, again, I'm, I'm struggling in these words, but that, that's what, what he did to me. It was phenomenal. And the thing about this horse is there's so much hype every time he runs from the time he broke his maiden back whenever last year. And you think he can't possibly live up to it. And he does every single time out. Matter of fact, I think he exceeds it. It was sensational. It was brilliant. It was dazzling. It was magic. Whatever superlative you want to come up with, Randy. You know, the the eight length margin of victory was not only the largest in the history of the Breeders' Cup Classic and visually impressive. If you dig a little deeper into the way the race set up, it makes the victory even more impressive, even more dynamic, if that's even possible. You know, the only concern that I and, and some other people had about flight line, the only possible scenario we could see him losing would be the fact that he had never had to chase a horse as fast as life is good. And what happened if he got competitive and they drew off down the back stretch 10 lengths ahead of the rest of the horses and the pace was out of control and he was facing by far the best group of horses he'd ever faced in his life. What would the final quarter mile look like for flight line in that scenario? And what happened? Life is good set as the data at Keeneland only goes back to 1991. He set the fastest quarter, half and three quarter mile fractions at a mile and a quarter in that 31 year period. In the history of the Breeders' Cup, Life is Good set the fastest quarter and three quarter mile fraction and tied for the fastest half mile fraction. They opened up 11 links on the field going down the backstretch. And the whole time going down the backstretch, Flight line was being ridden a little bit to keep up with life is good, to keep to stay in touch with life is good. So I was wondering, you know, how's he how's this going to play out now? And lo and behold, he did what he did and just blew by life is good, draws out through the stretch because of the way the race was run. He's not going to get another 126 buyer speed figure like he got in the Pacific Classic. But to get a 121. In those circumstances, the way that race shaped up is extremely flattering for flight line. As if he needs Randy, one. Tell me why. Tell me why he couldn't have got another one twenty six. I'm not sure your point there. Well, because he expended so much energy during during the first part of the race. You okay. know, one oh nine point two seven is now the uh, the adjusted six furlong fraction for the Breeders' Cup Classic, and and I think it's legitimate. I think it's fair, and just the efficiency of the race from Flightline's perspective. He expended a lot of energy during the first part of the race to try to keep up and stay in touch with life is good. There's no way that that's not going to have some effect on him, even being Flightline the last quarter of a mile. And I think it did. And the fact that he ran a 121 to me is amazing in those circumstances. It, it was a sublime performance. I only wish that I hadn't had to come home and was able to see the, it in person because I was there for Pharaoh's classic win and it was extraordinary. It was almost like being in the grandstand when Zenyatta took down the classic at Santa Anita. But it was an absolutely sublime performance to see those two horses go at it, to see Flavian Pratt, who rarely rarely ever looks behind. It was almost like he'd seen that picture of Ron Turcott and Secretariat when he's looking behind like that. It was almost like he was 
setting himself up for the picture, which has been got, it's been snapped. And for him to look around and to come up to perhaps the second best horse in the world, because we were all lauding life is good last year when he took down the Breeders' Cup dirt mile and said, oh, I was in the wrong race. You should have been the classic. And then Nick's go won the classic. And then he beat Nick's go down in, at the Pegasus World Cup. And it was like, life is good is the best thing ever. And to see Flavian Pratt come up next to life is good, still looking for competition, like sidled up next to him and is just doing this, like, where are they? Couldn't even barely see them behind him and going about his business. It was an extraordinary performance, one that we'll never see in the classic again. I mean, you won't ever see that. And the difference, with all due respect to American Pharaoh, as you pointed out, the, the difference between American Pharaoh's classic win in 2015 and flight lines is that all the early speed was was scratched out of that classic right. in 2015. And American Pharaoh had the opportunity to run an extremely efficient race on the early lead and conserve energy. Uh, flight line ran in a Breeders' Cup classic that fractionally was tailor made for a pace meltdown. And yet he not only overcame that, he excelled despite the circumstances. He basically ran in the sprint for six furlongs and then exactly. just kept going for a mile exactly. and a quarter is what he did. I mean, it has to be single-handedly the best performance on Breeders' Cup records ever. So the question becomes then, was this his best race ever? And the Pacific Classic was more dazzling. Not that this wasn't dazzling, but I mean, that race, the 19 and a quarter lengths and, and just, you know, your jaw dropped. You couldn't believe what you were seeing. This didn't quite live up to it, but I would say it was certainly his best race ever because of the level of competition. The level of competition in the Pacific Classic was, quite frankly, pretty weak behind him. Look at who he beat in this race. Uh, Taba, Olympiad, Rich Strike, Hot Rod Charlie, Epicenter did pull up, obviously. We know about that. Happy Saber. This was a really, really strong race behind him. Matter of fact, if Flightline weren't in this race, would have been saying this was a really good Breeders' Cup Classic. Life is good, of course. I didn't mention him. So I think based on the level of competition he faced and how he won so definitively, it was his best race ever. I mean, frankly, I would have been a little bit disappointed. This is how high the bar was set. If he went out and won by two and a half lengths in a drive over uh, Tabor or something like that or over Olympiad, you know, I said, well, yeah, he, he was good. But boy, I sure was kind of expecting more. He lived up to it. He crushed, absolutely crushed, a excellent field of horses and some horses who, in their own right, are stars. I mean, look at what a kind of horse Olympiad is. I mean, he's probably one of the most underrated horses we've had this year. Look at what kind of horse Taba is. We, Joey, Zoe just did a good job of telling us what kind of horse life is good is. So for that reason, I think this will go down, of his six races, the best race of his career. Yeah. I mean, I look at it as he duplicated his 19 and three quarter length win in the Pacific Classic just under different circumstances and against tougher competition. But I wouldn't argue with anyone uh, like you just pointed out, Bill, who would say that this that the Classic was the best race of his life. Hey, we all picked the under. So we should all be giving him a round of applause because we all picked under six lengths and he is definitely over six lengths. So Flightline wins. Drink. Hold on. This is water. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. So now the hype continues. And I don't even want to use you use the word anything with hype with this horse. It's kind of unfair. But, you know, everybody's now trying to put this in perspective. Where does he fit? Is he the goat? Is he is he on the Mount Rushmore? Where does he fit with the horses of all time? And, you know, to me, you know, does he is he the equal of secretary? I would say from a career standpoint, you just can't compare them. They're horses from two extremely different eras, different times in racing. Secretariat won the Triple Crown. Flightline didn't run in any of the Triple Crown races. Secretariat set a track record in all the Triple Crown races. Secretariat ran 21 times in his career. And what was also an abbreviated career, because he didn't come back at four after being retired after winning uh, up at Woodbine in his final career start. So, I, and then, you know, I, matter of fact, I talked to Ron Turcott the other day, and of course he said Secretariat was better. What, what would you expect? But he also brought up, you know, not only did he bring up Secretariat, he said, how do you compare him to a horse like Kelso, who, I, I don't know, what did he run? Probably 60, 70 times, won the Jockey Club Gold Cup five straight times. It's too much apples and oranges for me to even go there. But I would say this, if you just want to look at talent and nothing else, and ability, I'm not going to say he's as good as Secretariat, 
but I think he belongs in the same equation with him. He belongs in the same conversation, Randy. That's exactly what I said on NBC after the classic. I totally agree that he belongs in the same conversation. And it is impossible, in my opinion, to compare horses who compete 49 years apart. Too much has changed in the sport. There are too many variables that you can't account for. Even if you dive in to the metrics and you dive into the analytics and you try to do speed figures from 1973, like some speed figure makers have tried to do, and you compare them to 2022, I just don't think it can be done with any degree of certainty and with any degree of accuracy. So what we're left to do is just judge the two horses on the merits that we've seen uh, within the context of their particular generation. And I think it's just going to have to suffice to say that Flightline deserves to be in the conversation. I'm not willing, okay, even though I believe that there are races that Secretariat ran that in which Flightline would have beaten him. And I'm not talking about the Wood Memorial or his loss to Onion or his loss to Prove Out. I think there are probably some other races Secretariat ran that Flightline might have been able to get the best of him. But given the fact that Secretariat was a two-time horse of the year, uh, amazingly, he set records in the Kentucky Derby and Belmont time-wise that still stand 49 years later. And the Belmont record of which will probably never be equaled. Forget the 31 lengths, 224 flat for a mile and a half is just absurd. And then he not only does all that, he finishes his career beating the best turf horses in North America to boot. So I can't go as far as to say that Flightline is the equal of Secretariat, uh, but he deserves to be on Mount Rushmore. And uh, I don't think anybody would deny that. No, I think you're absolutely right with what you're saying. And this, like you said, it's a different time and age. You compare Flightline ran over two seasons, which he did. Secretariat ran over two seasons, but ran arguably a lot more times, 21 to 6. If you count the grade one wins, of course, the graded stakes system was actually only introduced in 1974. So if you're going down the page and counting them, you'll see that Flightline has four and you'll be like, oh, my goodness, Secretariat's only got five. But it wasn't introduced in in 1973. It was just it started happening in 74. So it, it's apples and oranges and it's a different time we're living in. And horses just simply don't run that much. For me, it would have been awesome to have seen Flightline run on the grass because I have always thought that he has a turfy action. His damn feather did her best running. She ran on the dirt and was a very good filly, but she did her best running on the grass. So if you put all that together, Sons of Tappet and Daughters of Tappet run on just about any surface. Could you imagine how good he might have been on the grass with that action? Imagine how good he might have been on an off track because John's always said he trains better when the, t- the track has been tighter in the mornings and he trained fantastically at Keeneland. The track was tight with the rain they got there. So I think sky's the limit and we're going to be forever saying what if, but it, it's done. He's been retired to stud and we all got to see that share sell on Monday, which was phenomenal. Oh my goodness. That was a lot of money. Yes, it was. So let's get to the retirement now. And I got it. I feel a little bit gullible. Um, I was drinking the Kool-Aid. <laughs> really? you know, maybe it just I was like a little kid at Christmas. This is so great. I don't want it to end. And hey, you know what? The owners, I, I don't really know what to make of all this talk beforehand. I mean, in, in the podcast, the podcast 1.0, um, you, know, you know, Costa Hronas came on and said that, you know, famous quote that we used, there's a great possibility that he's going to run next year. And, you know, other people told me, you know, don't be foolish. Of course, this horse isn't going to run next year. It's worth too much money, the insurance premiums to, to keep him going. Um, you know, and, and then all the talk, well, we're going to sit down and talk about it. And, you know, the uh, we woke up Monday morning and, and within five seconds, there was a press release. He's retired. And look, I get it. I can't say I'm, su- I'm I'm surprised. I just feel a little bit kind of foolish, a little bit that I, I you know, usually I'm a cynical guy. And I was anything but here thinking, oh, the, you know, the joy of this horse and they'll never they, they'll never let this go. And he's going to run next year. He's going to have five more starts and it's going to be the greatest thing for horse racing. And, uh, you know, I, I shame on me. I, I, I need to go back to my cynical, cranky self 
because I kind of look kind of silly in this. I mean, I even wrote, and I, I like the column, but I wrote this column in, in Monday's, uh, what would have been in Sunday's TDN about, you know, how they've got to bring them back and it's going to be the greatest thing ever. And, you know, again, by the time the ink was dry on the column and people printed it up on their printers, the horse was already retired. So, you know, no surprises. Obviously, I'm very, very disappointed. But uh, I guess I should have seen this coming. And, you know, I, I, but again, like I said, I get it from an economic standpoint. And this is as much as we love this as a sport. It's still a business. It made absolutely no sense to run them next year. Yeah, I think what, what did I say initially? I thought he had a one percent chance of coming back next year. And then I adjusted it upward when I found out that Bill Farish said that he would at least, you know, consider the possibility. Um, what kind of cemented it for me was when Farish told me that uh, when we discussed with him, I discussed with him the possibility and, and what some of the thinking would be. And he pointed out to me, this was not on our podcast. This was, this was another time. He said, if Flightline were to come back with another similar performance in the Breeders' Cup Classic at that point, one of the factors would be what else would he have to prove? And those, that's the exact language, basically, that Farish used after the fact, after he was retired. When they left the winner's circle Saturday, it was a 100% chance to me that he was going to be retired. That would have been the perfect avenue for them to announce that they were going to run him again the next year. And they would have known by then if they were going to run him. It would have been cheers from the grandstand. It would have been the perfect moment. When they left that winner's circle and they didn't make that statement, then I knew because they didn't want to spoil the moment. They didn't want to spoil the enthusiasm by saying in the winner's circle that he was going to be retired. But they knew. They knew when they were standing in the winner's circle. Is that enough, quite simply? I mean, you're only – you're asking for trouble after this. I mean, they've – Poor John, I mean, I can only imagine the kind of pressure that he's been under each and every day, training that horse, shipping that horse, waking up in the morning, you know, you're called to the barn and just wondering what's happened now. Anything can happen. Horses get sick, horses colic, horses come out limping. There's a multitude of things. The fact that he kept him undefeated for two seasons, and I'm not talking six for six, I'm talking undefeated for two years or you know just under two years that's a lot like that's a lot regardless of how many times you run the fact that he was able to get that horse ready for most of the scheduled races he missed one in between because of a hock injury but the fact that he was able to put a campaign like that together and not just staying in california shipping across the country as well was you know kudos to john and his team they did a fantastic job I've talked so much about this horse, I forget where I've said it. Did I go through the fantasy season for Flightline in 2023 on this podcast? You did not. I want to hear it. <laughs> okay, right. This kind of puts the economics in perspective. Suppose Flightline kept running in 2023. He starts off winning the Pegasus World Cup, right? Then he goes to Saudi and he wins the Saudi Cup. And then he goes to Dubai and he wins the Dubai World Cup. And then he gave him a couple of months off and he comes back and he wins the Whitney at Saratoga. And then they ship him back to California, and he wins the Pacific Classic at Del Mar. And they say, oh, what the heck? And he wins the Arc de Triomphe in Paris. <laughs> and he comes from the Arc de Triomphe. And he wins the Breeders' Cup Classic. And then they say, let's run him one more time. And he wins the Japan Cup in Tokyo. Oh, my goodness. Okay? That's, that's a season that's a virtual impossibility to achieve. That's better than Secretariat right there. That's $30 million in earnings. <laughs> he can make that much and probably more sitting at Lane's Inn Farm and breeding. Right. Yeah. Well, that, that's the point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. So then the, the big sale on Monday, he sells for $4.6 million, the 2.5% fractional share. You do the math, it makes him worth $184 million. I tried to get people beforehand to guess for how much he was going to sell for. They said, there's this type of thing you can't guess. The only thing I'll say about that, I don't think it makes him necessarily worth $184 million because it's a supply demand thing. There was only one of these being sold. If there were 10 being sold, would they have all gone for $4.6 million each? No, I don't think they would have. I mean, they still would have gone for a ton of money. But again, I, I don't want to uh, rain on their parade. It was a tremendous accomplishment and shows, you know, the, the, the popularity of this horse with breeders uh, and, 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 you know, the staggering amount that he's worth. But, you know, I think we ought to temper the enthusiasm a little bit on the $184 million. 
Yeah. So I was going to let you jump in there. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'm not sure I've got much more to say on Flightline. What, what's the guy's name that bought him? Nobody knows. They no, won't no, say. No. Fred was Seitz the, was, the, was the agent. He was the middle. Quote, yeah. unquote, undisclosed buyer, which is kind of silly to me. Why wouldn't the person want anybody to know? But whatever. I that's think a, it's been released. Right. There's been. Uh, not that I've seen. I don't know. You might know something that I don't. There, there's don't been know. some noise. All right. Well, I, I read some estimates before the two and a half percent sale that Flightline was going to be worth 80 million, 90 million. And I kind of I, I kind of threw the challenge flag on that mentally because the value of authentic when he was retired to stud was right at sixty five million dollars, his deal. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's a nice horse. Authentic won the Kentucky Derby and the Breeders' Cup Classic. All, you know, all hail authentic. And he's very well bred. But. If authentic is worth sixty five million, then I would think flight line would be worth probably double that at stud. Right. If not double, then somewhere in that vicinity, well over a hundred million dollars, I would say. A hundred and eighty four, I agree, is is probably uh, mm -hmm. circumstantial and it's probably not accurate, but he's <laughs> I wish I owned a part of him, I'll say that. <laughs> yeah, I'll go for point oh 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 two five yeah. percent and I'll be very, very happy. <laughs> All right. Yeah. And I think it's very cool that West Point Thoroughbreds with the November sale have been going around and buying some mares in a new partnership mm -hmm. to send to Flightline as well. And this is something they've never done before is, is buy mares right. to breed to their stallion, which, you know, that's a whole nother story in mm -hmm. of itself. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. There were an awful lot of horses that ran in the Keeneland Fall Meet that came back to win Breeders' Cup races. They include Forte, who took down the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Wonder Wheel. She took down the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies. We saw Malfat. She took down the Spinster. And then, of course, she won a fantastic edition of the Distaff. Caravelle took down the Grade 3 Franklin at the Keenan Fall Meet, and then she took down the Turf Sprint. The Keenan September Sale graduates include both Forte and Wonder Wheel, who graduated from the 2021 Keenan Sale. Malafat and Elite Power are graduates of the 2019 Keeneland sale. You can get an awful lot at Keeneland. And don't forget, the Keeneland November sale was off to a fast start. Book one stats from Monday include a champion Bid Midnight Bisu. She sold for $5.5 million. Ten, so 10 lots sold for $1 million or more. Average price, $492,000. And don't forget, the sale does continue through November the 17th. We'll be right back after these messages from Keeneland. When the thoroughbred world descends upon Lexington this November, there is one place you need to be. The place where history comes alive with every championship victory. He's on the dick indeed! The place where the future is built with the fall of a gavel the place that exists to be the heart of this industry, the center of it all. Home to the November Breeding Stock Sale and the 2022 Breeders' Cup, Keeneland. It was just put together like a machine and he had a great mind. Everything about him was what you'd want. Tis the law, pops the cork and the champagne. Tis the law is gonna win the first leg of the Triple Crown. I've never seen him get tired. Respect the law, tis the law. His structure is just perfect. His bone is perfect. He's left the others behind. He's gonna win the run, Happy Travers. He's everything you would look for in a horse. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Coolmore. What a weekend Uncle Mo had at Keeneland. Talk about a winning son of Uncle Mo. Let's talk about Arabian Knight, a Baffert second time out who broke his maiden at Keeneland on Saturday and was named a TDN Rising Star. There was an Uncle Mo weanling filly out of Bellafina who sold for $1.35 million. And he also had a trio of million dollar mares at that sale. Also standing new at Coolmore is Golden Pal, now retired to Ashford. Bill. So speaking of Arabian Night, there, there is an offshore bookmaker has already put up prices for the next year's 2023 Kentucky Derby. It's called betonline.ag. They've made Arabian Night the second choice wow. at 16 to 1. But, uh, better than Cave Rock, as a matter of fact. Forte is 12 to 1, so that's the kind of uh, play that Arabian Night is getting. 
off that very impressive win for the cool more sire uncle mall okay one of the we did all the flight line all the time oh did we go over or under on the 200 references to flight line is it right about close huh what do you think i think it's over okay um other there were of course other breeders cup stories to talk about and the europeans what a day they had what a two days they had seven turf races six of them won by the europeans two trainers dominated and only two Aiden O'Brien and Charlie Appleby. And as good as Aiden O'Brien was, I left there thinking, I will never not pick a Charlie Appleby horse again in any way. I don't care if he brings his stable pony over. I am picking him, and I feel so foolish for picking against him on the podcast uh, last week. I tried to poke some holes in some of them. This guy is absolutely unbelievable. He's 9 for 17 career in the Breeders' Cup. Now, how does that stack up against some of the best trainers in Breeders' Cup history? Wayne Lucas is the leading trainer in Breeders' Cup history with 20 wins. He's won with 12% of his starters. Bob Baffert is second with 18 wins. He's won with 13% of his starters. Aiden O'Brien, his contemporary, his main rival in Europe, has won with 9% of his starters, and that's after winning the three here. And over the last two years, he entered eight Breeders' Cup races and won six of them. And to me, it would be seven of eight if Silver Knot got out of the gate in the juvenile turf. He had a very tough trip and then lost to O'Brien in a very tight photo. And I think he was best in there. Uh, and Charlie Appleby is unbelievable. And what he's doing, and there's no letting up, he's doing this time after time, not just in the Breeders' Cup, but anything he brings to North America. And the other thing, too, is I don't think he's necessarily bringing stars over here. I mean, these are very good horses, but they're not horses that, you know, the Baides or the Alpinistas of European racing. He obviously knows exactly who to bring over, how to do it. And take nothing away from Aiden O'Brien, but I thought Charlie Appleby was, again, for the second straight year, the training star of the Breeders' Cup. Well, the European dominance was... I, I... Not surprising. Yeah, I wanted to say astounding, but that almost makes it sound like that it, it's a surprise. And it's not, obviously, because we know year in, year out, the Americans excel on dirt primarily and the Europeans dominate most of the turf races. Uh, at Keeneland, the last 11 Breeders' Cup races that have been run at Keeneland specifically, European horses have won 10. That's and, and the and the only outlier there, it was the Saturday turf sprint that Caravelle had to run the race of her life to win. She ran a 107 buyer speed figure, somehow pulled that one out. And Europeans ran second, third, and fourth behind Caravelle. And they never win the turf sprint either. Right. So. Exactly. So uh, you know, look, it I think the primary you've got three colossuses worldwide in breeding. You've got Coolmore slash Aiden O'Brien. You've got Godolphin slash Charlie Appleby. And you've got Judmont and, and their various trainers, including, including John Gosman. They all won races at this Breeders' Cup. And I think the, the primary thing that makes them so formidable is that whereas in the United States, most of the top breeding farms are commercial breeders and they sell at Keeneland and they sell at other sales and, and they disperse their top horses around the country to, to various buyers. Coolmore, Godolphin, Judmont all breed to race. And they all collect these unbelievable broodmare bands and they don't put them up for yearling auction. They keep them. And that's what makes, you know, it because they have so much money behind them and, and they develop these generation by generation deep broodmare bands. They're just unbelievable. That they are the the formidable owners slash breeders in the world. We saw it at the Breeders' Cup. They won three. Godolphin won three. Coolmore won three. Uh, and their involvement in the Breeders' Cup, their commitment to the Breeders' Cup, cannot and should not be underestimated as far as the success of the Breeders' Cup. Okay, they played instrumental roles. So far, Coolmore has had 195 Breeders' Cup starters. Godolphin has had 158. Judmont has had 86. The top North American owner in the Breeders' Cup is in the mid-40s. Coolmore has brought more than four times as many horses to the Breeders' Cup over the years as the top American owner has. And they didn't even really get started bringing horses over until like the late 1980s or so. 
So it, it's just astounding what these organizations have done worldwide and what they've done at the Breeders' Cup. And I think it really adds to the Breeders' Cup year in and year out. I think it's fantastic because it's now truly is a worldwide event. And it's really interesting that the Euros fare so well at Keeneland because it's yeah. it's a tighter turf course. It's inside the main track and it's a sand based turf course. And I don't know if they're just getting a little bit of better acceleration, a little better push off of that sand based turf course. Cause I know over the years, sometimes the best turf horses in the world don't like Keeneland and sometimes horses only like Keeneland. So it's been a tricky turf course to gauge over the years. And I'm not knocking the turf course at all, but it's one of the few in North America that are sand based turf courses. It drains very, very well, but I've ridden over it numerous times and some horses just don't like it. Some horses love it. And then you can't find them with a the search warrant at Churchill or at the fairgrounds or at Santa Anita. So it's a tricky turf course to gauge. And as far as Godolphin and Coolmore coming over with their homebreds. I mean, they've been fantastic. Judmont of late have had not as many homebreds as they did, say, two decades ago. They've done very well at the sales and have been predominantly buying an awful lot of their horses. You go back and look at those horses, a lot of them are being bought and they're kind of going a different direction now as Judmont, but they're still buying very good horses and winning an awful lot of races at the Breeders' Cup. So for me, it was a fantastic Breeders' Cup in that sense. And Randy, oh my goodness, did you ever hitch your little red wagon to the right trainer? Because you were all over Appleby like a rash. So I applaud you for that. I'm supposed to be buying you Bloody Marys for as long as you can drink them. And Holly Doyle perhaps did not have her best day. She also wasn't that well mounted at the end of it. A, a, you know, the Platinum Queen was perhaps done for the year. And Nashua never really got a shot to show what she's made of. So, yes, I, when I see you, Randy, Bloody Mary's on me. Well, I, I may choose to sub out Margarita for Bloody Mary. That's but fine. Uh, thank That's you fine. For the, Thank you for the, for the commitment there. As far as the Keeneland thing, I've got a theory about that. And, and okay. I, you know, I talked to some trainers about it. Uh, we saw at the beginning of the Keeneland meet, the, the, the course, the turf course was extremely firm. Uh, they were setting stakes records in almost almost every every stakes that they that they rolled out there. It was hard. And I, I was told they did this in 2020 as well. Uh, they had a watering program leading up to the Breeders' Cup, uh, I think, to try to sort of out of fairness, to try to put a little a little more give into the turf course and make it fair for both the Europeans and for the Americans. And we saw that horses could come from well off the pace over the Keeneland turf course. It was very honest as far as speed. We saw an Italian almost hang on to win the Philly and Mare turf, but you could also come from last place like a couple of the Appleby horses did. Um, it was very fair in that regard. I think it had a little bit of cut in the ground. I think it was the perfectly honest course and the results were what we saw. When you get that situation with Charlie Appleby and Coolmore, the Europeans dominate. And how about, I, and I have to say this as well, Ryan Moore and Bill Buick, oh. and of course, James Doyle, riding circles. And I'm sorry, American jockeys, they rode absolute circles around them to close from that far back, to find the trip. We even saw it in the juvenile turf. Mike Smith on Pax Wallop came off the rail. Maybe he should have stayed there and went around horses. And then you see the Godolphin Blue coming straight down the rail. Those guys rode circles around some of our best jocks over here. No question. Seven, seven miles for Ryan Moore, three wins, three seconds, and a sixth, I believe, on Order of Australia. Just an amazing little, day for Ryan I felt Moore. a little bit for your co-host having to interview Ryan because I love Ryan, but he, he's not always the best interview in the world. It would be like trying to interview Mike Maker three times in a row. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We all tried that. So I, I did feel for Donna um, having to interview right. Ryan three times. So the, the best race of the Breeders' Cup, and you know, I'm not going back to flight line here, but I think we knew this going in. Boy, did the distaff live up to expectations. What That was a, as sensational a race as you're going to see in the Breeders' Cup with three horses on the wire, a nose apart, with Malathat in her final career race, getting the victory over Blue Stripe, and then another nose back to Clarier. I kind of feel bad for the trainer, Marcelo Polanco, the, the 
big boys so dominated the Breeders' Cup. This guy has won only seven races total over the last three years, and he loses by a nose in the Breeders' Cup distaff. But uh, it was not uh, all frowns on their faces because the next day they sold the horse for $4 million at Fasic Tipton. And the horse is not going to go for $4 million if she didn't run that tremendous race in the Breeders' Cup. So shout out to Marcelo Polanco. It would have been nice to see someone other than the super trainers and uh, O'Brien and uh, Appleby win uh, a Breeders' Cup race, but it wasn't meant to be with, you know, Mott having also, uh, Mott and Pletcher also having a tremendous run. But, you know, the, uh, talk about a race living up to, up to expectations, Randy. Oh, let me, uh, ask I mean, guys, let me ask you guys a question because you both picked Nest, okay? Uh, what happened? I picked Clary, pick Clary Air. Okay. Yeah, I picked Society. I'm even worse. Go ahead. Oh, okay. So, so, but what happened to Nest? That's a good question. I don't know. Was she? Not, I, I, I. First, I was getting ready to say she wasn't good enough, but I think she's a better filly than that. Um, you know, she didn't run a terrible race, but you know, she. I guess she just didn't have it. Uh, it wasn't her day. I, I like to come up unless Randy has some more uh, a better theory than that. That's the best I can come up with, Zoe. No, I mean it was very difficult to gauge her prep race coming in to the Breeders' Cup because she was one to twenty. Right. And she wins by nine lengths or whatever against horses that she just completely laid over on paper. The only theory I have is that maybe she just didn't quite get enough out of that race from a maybe not so much from a conditioning standpoint as from a mental, you know, toughness kind of standpoint, uh, you know, that that would really get her primed mentally to face horses of the caliber of Malathat and Clary Air. And as it turned out, Blue Stripe. That's my only theory about Ness. But boy, what a race. What a race that was. I was glad to see Clary Air bounce back uh, from her poor race when she hit her head in the starting gate in the personal incident. And I think the difference between Malafet and Clary Air was just trip, as it usually is between those two horses. But that race really, really lived up to advanced billing. It was, they got some great pictures for that. Three heads on the wire. Perfect. One, two, three. It, it really was a race for the ages. And I'm delighted for Malafat. I think she deserved it. I feel for Marcelo. I know Marcelo out here. And he said he finally got Blue Stripe figured out. And Marcelo can train a good horse. If you remember the work that he did probably a couple of decades ago with Island Sand, she was a grade one winner. And that's pretty much the last good horse that he had. He managed her career very, very well. And, and he didn't get Blue Stripe all that long ago and has figured her out very, very quickly. So he can do it with the right horse. It's just being given the opportunity in this day and age. I apologize right. for not looking this up in advance in my in my reams and reams of charts that I don't have on my iPad. Sorry, Zoe. Um, <laughs> but I, I feel pretty confident in, in uh, saying that this is probably the only race in the history of the Breeders' Cup in which the winner wins by a nose and the second place horse is a nose ahead of the third place horse. All right, Randy, Zoe asked you what happened to Nest. I'm going to ask you what happened to Jackie's Warrior third year. You know, it's, it's kind of unfortunate. He's such a good horse, but three years in a row, odds on favorite. And he really laid an egg this year uh, in the sprint. Do uh, you have any theories on that one? Yeah, well, other than he just got outrun, um, because Elite Power, I think, is a uh, is a really nice up and coming horse. But I, well, I think what we've seen from Jackie's Warrior uh, throughout his career is that when he is uh, clearly the dominant horse in a race, he wins with such authority and so impressively and so easily that it makes people think that he's that he can run that way every time. And then when he gets into a race, as in this case with Super Ocho and a lot of early pace pressure, uh, sometimes he doesn't run quite that well. Sometimes he does, but his worst races are, are when he's in that situation. And he ran well. He finished third. And he was right there digging in through the stretch. Uh, but this was one of those days with the pace pressure, et cetera, where he wasn't good enough. That's all I can say. And, and I think, you know, if you look back, especially to last year as well, not the four or five races is a long campaign. Campaign, Well, it is now. It's, it's always at the end of the year when he's run some massive, massive races. Last year, he went out with a knee chip. So that was the excuse. Maybe this year he's got something else. We'll never know. He's been retired to the breeding shed. But it's the tail end of the year when he's run some massive, massive numbers and some massive races, which even though inherently they look like the horses are doing it easy, 
they need a certain right. period to recover off those races. We last saw him run a huge number. That's back in August. So he ran a big number on the sheets. So Steve gave him the time he needed. Maybe he needed more time, you know, and, and Steve rarely runs a horse that is not at the top of their game. He's very, very good at gauging when a horse is going to run his best race. They usually get good, they stay good, and then they're retired. That's what Steve does. So, you know, maybe it's just the end of a long year, so to speak, for Jackie's Warrior. I mean, I don't know. He didn't run awfully. Just yeah, you know, I, I, you know. I felt really badly for Asmussen at the end of the Breeders' Cup. Oh, he had a horrible day. Oh, yeah. I mean, e Echo Zulu ran well in defeat, but... Yes. To have Jackie's Warrior go out like that, it was very upsetting to him. And then to have what happened to Epicenter, uh, knock on wood, it looks like he's going to be okay for his stud career. But you know, I mean, what a you know what a horrible Saturday for uh, for Steve Asmussen and Private and Green I, ran with him on Friday. I, I felt for him as well because, and I love this for Steve because he's basically a horseman first. If you know Steve, he can be a little bit gruff on the outside, but he loves his horses. He doesn't want to deal with the media only when he has to. There was a picture of him running to the backside to get his horse. He He's not like a paper trainer who will stand on the front side and call the vet and talk on the phone. He sprinted from the front side to the back backside to be with that stricken horse. His two assistants, uh, Scott Blasey and Sarah Campion, went with the horse in the ambulance. They stayed with the horse as long as they possibly could. So kudos to the whole team for putting the horse first. And even though Steve doesn't mentioned. go looking for TV cameras, right? I mean, we know, as you as you pointed out, uh, to his credit, yes. When Jackie's Warrior lost, right? How many trainers in that situation would be nowhere to be found, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. They would be hit. They would make the excuse, "I got to go back to the barn to be with my horse or whatever." Steve will stand up in front of the TV cameras when, when in his moments of most bitter disappointment, epicenter after the Kentucky Derby, when he thought he had it won and Rich Strike ran him down at 80 to one shot in the closing strides. We see it time and time again with Steve. Uh, he'll stand up there and and face the music when his horses don't run up to expectations. It also should be noted that domestic spending, the other horse who was injured, also seems to be that he's going to be fine as well. Chad Brown's been tweeting and updating everybody on that, which is much uh, appreciated. He had a broken pelvis, and uh, obviously he's going to be retired, and Chad Brown says they're going to give him a great home after his uh, uh, recovery is full. So uh, some bad news that turned into good news with the two horses that were injured at the Breeders' Cup. Both are going to be fine. So Flightline was two to five to win the Breeders' Cup Classic and came through. If you think those are short odds, it's this is about a one to 50 shot. The Lane's In Stallion of the Week, <laughs> drum roll please, is Flightline. Stay tuned for his stud fee. That's going to be fascinating. And with a horse of his speed and stamina and pedigree and with the mares that are going to be uh, delivered to flight line from not just North America, but from all over the world. You know, racing fans, breeders, owners everywhere are going to be uh, eagerly awaiting his first weanlings and yearlings and two year olds. Flight line, the Lane's End Stallion of the Week. Accelerate, a five time grade one winner with over six million in earnings. In 2018 alone, he won the Santa Anita Handicap, the Gold Cup. The Pacific Classic by a record setting 12 and a half lengths. The Awesome Again and bested a world class field in the Breeders' Cup Classic. A grandson of legendary Lane's End Stallion Smart Strike, Accelerate stands to continue his grandsire's legacy at Lane's End. The legacy of Adina Springs is monumental. This is one of the greatest horse farms built in modern racing history. The way this farm was developed makes it a premier facility to raise a horse. It has 20 horse barns. It has 25 homes for employees. There's about 250 stalls on this farm. You appreciate the fact that he took a blank canvas and developed it to one of the finest horse farms in all of America. Adina Springs is poised for somebody to come in at the very highest levels into the thoroughbred racing industry.
So congratulations to Leonard and John Green for their victory, DJ Stables, and the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies with Wonder Wheel. That works good in this spot right here because their green group, an accounting and tax consulting advisory firm specializing in thoroughbreds, happens to be the sponsor of our green group guest of the week. Learn more about how they can help you by going to www.greenco.com. And we welcome in our Green Group Guest of the Week, Lisa Lazarus, the CEO of the Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Authority. Lisa, welcome. First question that I have off the top of the bat, uh, where are things right now regarding the assessments with the states? Are there some states you're having problems reaching agreements with? And come January 1, if you don't reach agreements with them, what happens next? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me today. I'm really delighted to be here. Um, So as you probably know, there are 14 states that are actually racing on January 1st. So we only have about half of the the, the overall number that we that we regulate racing on January 1. Um, We're pretty far along with the number of states in terms of reaching agreements. If we don't reach an agreement with them, what essentially happens is the Horse Racing Integrity and Welfare Unit uh, essentially hire staff to perform the services that the state racing commissions used to perform. So the assessments essentially are based on the recognition that we're sort of all better off if we can keep mm-hmm. the money that's currently being spent towards anti-doping in the system. And we do that by obviously reaching agreements with state racing commissions. In those states where we can't, what ultimately happens is the obligation falls to the race tracks to be the collectors and to essentially come up with a formula for covered persons within that state or that are using that track to contribute towards the assessment. So Lisa, if you didn't know before you took this job, which I'm sure you did, I mean, you know now, horse racing is, I guess, traditionally resistant to any kind of change. And there was obviously a lot of pushback to HISA when it was first proposed and then it was first enacted that you guys have been having to deal with. How does... So how has some of that initial resistance uh, been overcome and where do you stand right now, you think, overall with, with some of those situations? So I think, number one, you know, you're absolutely correct. I mean, one of the things that's useful as we look to launch the anti-doping program on January 1 is that we've had a number of months where we've been overseeing and implementing the racetrack safety program. So we've gotten to know the state racing commissions. We've gotten to know a lot of the racetracks. And I think, honestly, listen, I I certainly can sit here and say that everybody's on board now. But I definitely feel that each day we get closer and closer to acceptance and support. And I think that's really about the tone that we set and that my staff sets in terms of wanting to help, you know, make the industry better. We're not looking to make things more difficult or more complicated. We're looking to perform to basically provide this foundation of safety and integrity that everyone in racing can build their businesses upon, you know, that that sort of stable, stable foundation. And I think that there's starting to be a recognition that that's happening. And I also think that, you know, when, when the legislation was being discussed and ultimately passed, everybody was talking about how great it would be to have a national sort of unifying anti-doping program where every horse is tested for the same substance at the same levels. And we launched in July, we didn't provide that. We provided, you know, racetrack safety rules. And so I think there's good support anticipation around the anti-doping program. And um, I'm looking forward to, to, to launching it in January. Lisa, first off, I would like to personally thank you because you have a thankless task. This is the job that <laughs> nobody wanted coming in. So from myself personally, and I'm, I'm sure the guys here and the rest of the industry, I, I would really like to thank you. Well, thank you because it really is a thankless task. And then we're moving towards January the 1st. What can you tell us about Five Stones moving forward? Because they are the guys that really got this on a mission. They turned up a lot of good stuff over the past couple of years. And how are they going to start enforcing things come January 1st? So, you know, we have been engaging with Five Stones around some of the work that they've done to try to really, you know, take on board some of the learnings um, and some of the processes. The Horse Racing Integrity and Welfare Unit is also building their own internal capability, their own internal investigations team, which is very strong um, and is going to include some some sort of well-known and, and well-established faces. And really, we're going to, you know, I think probably why you asked the question and it really resonates with me 
is that the new program is going to be very much intelligence and investigations based. It's not going to be based solely on, you know, conducting a whole lot of tests. It's going to be, it's going to look at the, what we call sort of smart testing, because we believe that's really important to make a difference. And I think if you look at all the top ant doping programs in the world, equine and otherwise, you'll see that the successful ones that really deliver integrity to their sports rely heavily on investigations. That's great. Thanks. Because, I mean, what they've uncovered over the past couple of years has really changed yeah. this industry for the better. They truly have. No, they, they have certainly done a terrific job and, and we're lucky to have them as, as part of the sport. So, Lisa, the uh, HISA has been sort of phased in, I, 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 I suppose, is the, is, the, is the best way to put it, with the medication mm -hmm. component coming up January the 1st. Once you get involved, once you get we get up to January the 1st, is it all going to be the medication component of this all going to be enacted at the same moment, every part of it? Or are there going to be similar sort of phase ins from the medication standpoint? Yeah, no, that's a great question, Randy. I mean, the difference with the anti-doping and medication control program is really significant with regards to the launch because we take the entire space, you know, come January 1, state racing commissions won't have the authority to conduct any sort of sample analysis or testing. And so it's also in some ways, it's, it's a bigger opportunity. It's certainly a bigger lift, but it's also allows us kind of the tools to be, I think, even more successful because you can't truly have kind of uniform integrity, uniform anti-doping rules. If you don't also have, you know, uniform lab analysis, you know, uniform chain of custody, um, investigators were all, you know, operating off the same sort of hymn sheet. So those are all the things that we're putting in place. And, and I think what you'll notice on January 1 is a very different look and feel with how anti-doping is, is actually conducted in the States. So it seems as if the biggest resistance that you've had so far has been from the state of Texas, who is even willing to, you know, sort of voluntarily suspend all, you know, out of state simulcasting and basically economically shoot themselves in the foot to try to to try to make a point i assume where does texas stand now with regards to the uh to the whole heisa situation so texas um as you as you recognize took themselves out of heisa authority by essentially um informing all of the racetracks in texas that they weren't authorized to export their signal for paramutual wagering so heisa gets its jurisdiction from thoroughbred racetracks that export their signal. That's essentially kind of the criteria to fall within our jurisdiction. And so when Texas essentially cut that off, um, they no longer became a part of the states that we regulate. Um, so, so Ukraine, and there's been no change to that. I mean, we would love to have Texas, obviously. We would love to engage with them. Um, but they, they take the position that they can't implement HISA rules because it, they conflict with, uh, the Texas Racing Commission's code. Um, you know, we just have a sort of a dispute over over the application of, of the code and, and HISA, but but they've taken this position and, you know, and we're moving forward. Is there anything different with the Texas code as opposed to the code in other state racing commission? Uh, not in my opinion. I mean, they're essentially Texas's view is that because the Texas racing code gives the Texas racing commission exclusive jurisdiction to run racing in that state. Um, that they therefore don't have the authority to implement HISA. Um, what I would say to that is, you know, when racing commissions were created, there was no expectation that there'd be a federal authority or a federal law. So many racing commissions codes say that very same thing, but they've recognized that federal preemption is, you know, is the governing principle and have accepted that HISA has the authority. Um, whereas Texas takes a different position. So what happens if a lot of other states want to, follow suit. Can they? Sure. I mean, any state can decide that they no longer want to be under HISA's authority by declining to export their signals. But that's a very massive financial penalty um, for the racetracks to endure. And so we haven't seen any signs that any other state will take that same position. Where did the legal challenges that have been uh, put forth by Texas and I think a couple of other states, where does that stand right now in the, in the court system? 
So we're waiting for, there are two appeals, both in the Fifth Circuit and the Sixth Circuit. And then there's also um, the case that originated um, in Louisiana, uh, you know, not that long ago. And, and those cases are, are now essentially, you know, before the, the judges were, were awaiting decision. Lisa, I have a question about the, the racetrack safety and integrity program. And um, at least one racetrack, which our Dan Ross has been writing about, Mountaineer Park, clearly has not uh, been up to par so far as what Heiza wants of the racetracks. I don't know if there's others out there, but, you know, Mountaineer is a pretty good example. Uh, what can be done about something like this and how can you get everybody on board with this? So, you know, we're engaging daily with all of the with any of the racetracks that we feel are not meeting the safety requirements. Um, if if those racetracks continue to ignore, you know, ignore the rules and, and, and continue to resist sort of getting up to speed and fulfilling the obligations that, you know, our rules require, then there is progressive discipline um, that we will we will obviously enforce. And that culminates in, you know, the, the removal of the signal. How close to you are you to doing something like that? I mean, this sounds pretty draconian. Um, could that be ultimately what would happen to some of these racetracks? And it, so I want you to repeat, they would not be able to send out their simulcasting signal anymore. That would be the ultimate punishment? Correct. Exactly. Lisa, what's the general feel moving forward? Because I saw you at Breeders' Cup and uh, you were there, you were shaking hands, kissing babies, doing all the right things and meeting with all the right people. What is what is the general feel moving forward? Because from my perspective, it's it's positive. So what have people told you about Heisa moving forward and what complaints have they had at the same time? So, you know, I've had a lot of really positive feedback in the last couple of months. I genuinely feel that the tide is shifting in a lot of places. Um, of course, there's always going to be groups that resist, but I think there's a recognition that Hayes is here to stay and that we're not the enemy. You know, we're trying to support the industry, help grow the industry, give the industry the tools it needs to be successful, you know, for, for many years to come. And so that's, that's a really significant difference. I think in terms of the complaints, you know, some of the complaints that we heard early on was that there was not enough engagement from horsemen who are on the track every day. Um, I took that complaint to heart. And, you know, and a lot of that was about the speed at which we had to create rules, et cetera. And we have very capable committees who are doing that. But we established the Horseman's Advisory Group, um, which now has, you know, 19 sort of very well regarded, at least I think well regarded um, members across the country in different roles. And I'm engaging with them regularly when I have questions and we're meeting. And I think that's going to really, you know, close a very important gap. And the feedback to that's been really positive. I feel like everybody, sort of the, the, the philosophy behind creating that group was every single racing participant should feel that somebody in that group speaks for them, you know? And that's what we've, that's what we've been able to accomplish. What's been the hardest part, like the very hardest part that you've had to deal with that's had the most pushback? So I think the hardest part is from, you know, horsemen or race participants who really feel that this is making their lives harder um, or not achieving the goal of improving the industry, et cetera. And I think that that's something that we only can show over time. You know, there were a lot of, before the racetrack safety program launched, there were a lot of rumors circulating about, you know, highs of going to people's homes and searching homes and farms and whatever. And I think now that we're a number of months in and none of that's materialized, um, I think I think a lot of that kind of anxiety is really calming down. And some of the benefits, because as I said, I think a lot of trainers, I would actually say the majority of trainers really want uniform, robust anti-doping rules. And I think with that on the horizon, you know, attitudes are shifting and then sort of folks are saying, OK, let, let's sort of see, this is really going to work. We're really going to get that thing we've always wanted, which is a level playing field. Um, and that's, I think, where I see I see change. Lisa, the uh, four months in, where do things stand with the crop rule? And are you satisfied how that's been going? So I think the crop rule is really one of the big success stories of Haiza. Um, we faced a lot of resistance around the crop rule when it was first, you know, when it was first introduced um, back in July. And there was, you know, a, a learning curve to get all the jockeys on the same page and fairly so because they've been operating in with different rules across multiple jurisdictions. Um, but now a number of, of months in, we're seeing a lot of very encouraging signs. First of all, if you watch the, the Breeders' Cup, I think it was an extraordinary display of 
why excessive crop use is not necessary and doesn't enhance the sport. Um, second of all, we see a real, a really, a real plateau in the number of violations um, across the country. A lot of the, you know, concern or sort of negative feedback, to the extent we had any, was around the fact that if you were over nine strikes, if you got into ten strikes or more than three strikes above the limit, that you would face purse disqualification. Well. We believed, or at least the Racetrack Safety Committee believed, that if you were going to actually genuinely have an impact on crop use, you'd have to bring in stakeholders who had more at stake than, than just the jockeys. And those are only 6% of our overall number of, of um, crop violations, which I think is quite a low number. And they've really tapered off. I don't think we've had one in quite a while. Um, and, you know, we've also looked, you know, we've only had four months or so of data. What the data does show us, you compare the same months in 2021 the 2022 program, there's no change in overall race times. Um, there's no impact on the wagering public. So I think over time, we'll be able to prove that these sort of balanced crop rules are better for the sport. They don't change the sport um, and they don't change and they don't change for the betting public. So I, I really feel it's as, I mean, there may be things we tweak down the road based on feedback, et cetera. But overall, I think the crop rule has been very successful and is working. Very good. Well, Lisa, thank you so much for joining us today in the TDN Writers Room. And uh, I agree uh, with Zoe. Thank you for everything you're doing for the industry and good luck moving forward. Well, thank you. And thank you so much for having me today. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, a tax consulting and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. As this week's Guest of the Week, Lisa Lazarus, will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. Learn more by going to www.greenco.com. We'll be right back after this message from The Green Group. Why do the most successful owners, breeders, and horsemen select the Green Group as their tax advisor? We simply save them money and know how to make them more successful. Over the past 40 years, founder Leonard Green has owned and bred some of the best racehorses in the history of the sport. His in-depth, hands-on industry knowledge, combined with cutting-edge tax-saving strategies, has produced positive results for his clientele and has made the Green Group the top-rated accounting and tax firm in the business. For a confidential and complimentary consultation, contact us at 732-634-5100 or visit our website at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. With some of the fullest fields in the country and quality racing year-round, there's never been a better time to reap the rewards of breeding and racing in Kentucky. Purse money in Kentucky is at an all-time high, as is average purse per race, outpacing California, Florida, and New York. Kentucky Breads. Breed them. Raise them race them. We all win. The TD and Writers Room is brought to you by the Kentucky Thoroughbred Association. This just in, Kentucky Breds won five Breeders' Cup races highlighted by Flightline's victory in the Classic, and those wins give Kentucky Breds a total of 240, count them, 240 Breeders' Cup victories, obviously well more than any other state or country. So the win by flight line in the Breeders' Cup Classic, that's a total no-brainer for an Eclipse Award. As usual out of the Breeders' Cup, there's some, there, there's no, you know, unanimous winners, Forte, Wonder Wheel, uh, stuff like that. But it's always fun to look at the awards. And I, I picked a couple divisions that maybe aren't complete slam dunks. See if we get any debate here whatsoever. Um, I'm not going to have any problem filling out my ballot this year. Um, first of all, three-year-old male. Um, I, to me, it kind of is a slam dunk. I mean, Epicenter, I know the knock on him is he only won one grade one race this year. You know, unfortunately, he was hurt in the Breeders' Cup Classic, so we didn't get to see what he could do in there. But he had the most complete year of any three-year-old by far. I mean, he did win the Louisiana Derby as well in the Jim Dandy, two very, very good races. I actually saw some people on Twitter suggesting that Rich Strike should be the three-year-old champion. I don't see that at all. Um, you know, he's really a one-race wonder. I know he's done, you know, pretty well in his last couple races. And I, I tell you, if Cyberknife had won the Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile, I would have voted for him for three-year-old champion. And they only lost in a close photo there um, to Cody's wish. So, you know, those are the main contenders there. But Randy Epicenter is going to be on your ballot. Yeah, yeah. I, I would definitely uh, have Epicenter on my ballot for three-year-old champion. Like, all, I, Tabor ran well. I don't think you can hold Epicenter's Breeders' Cup Classic against him, obviously. I mean, he didn't even make make the course, so th that's a that's a cross-off. The Kentucky Derby is the tiebreaker, in my opinion, and 
epicenter finished ahead of Taba, well ahead of him in the Kentucky Derby. So it's definitely epicenter for me as champion three-year-old. Epicenter for me, danced every dance. I mean, he really did. He barely missed a beat since breaking his maiden last year. He ran pretty much every month until he didn't run in September and October and has been fantastic. Three group graded, grade two wins for him. Grade one winner, it's epicenter for me. And you just mentioned Cody's wish. I'm going to rewind back to Breeders' Cup, Randy. The story on Cody's wish was one of the best ones I think I've ever seen. What a performance he put in. It gave me chills. And just, I'm not sure that a lot of people realize the connection between horses and humans is as strong as that. Cody Dorman, what a fantastic story that was. I know you guys were choked up. On oh. set, um, it, 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 you couldn't write that. There is no way you could even write a Hollywood script like that with Cody's Wish winning. No, I mean Ahmed Fareed and Jerry Bailey and myself up on the set. I mean we're all fathers, and and you can empathize, and and I think we're all kind of softies as well. You know, I mean I get I, I'll I'll tear up at a TV commercial sometimes, <laughs> and and so they wanted me to watch that feature ahead of time because they know me and they didn't yeah. want to just throw it on me right there sitting on the set. Uh, and I watched it and, and got misty eyed. And then when we did it for real on the set, I had to take the IFB out of my ear because I didn't want to hear it again. You know, I, yeah. and then lo and behold, the horse wins. And I look over at I'm in Fareed and he's starting to lose it. And I look over at Jerry Bailey and he's starting to lose it. And I was starting to lose it. And it was just, you know, one of those things that that was just a storybook ending. And then you saw just when we got our composure back and we're in, you know, we take a deep breath Then they have a shot, close up shot of Cody Dorman with tears oh, streaming. Down face. Oh. That was so amazing. I mean, unable to speak or have any kind of emotion. The fact that there's so much going in, going on in that head of his that he can't communicate, which he obviously can because he's got his computer and communicates through that. But to see the tears of happiness, it it was fantastic. Yeah. I can't really believe was. I mentioned that earlier in our Breeders' Cup recap, but I'm glad you brought that up because that was one of the real, the, the most obviously poignant moment of uh, of the two days of the Breeders' Cup. It truly was. Yeah, just a terrific story there. Well done by the entire NBC team. All right, so let's move on to turf male. Um, I'm usually I don't go for European horses in these categories. I don't like I, I don't like the horses that come in only one time and win a Breeders' Cup race. I don't think that's doing enough on the soil. But Modern Games is a two race wonder. Uh, he wins the Breeders' Cup Mile and also wins the Woodbine Mile at uh, Woodbine, of course, for Charlie Appleby. Uh, it was a very undistinguished year among American turf horses. So once again, I'll have no problem. Won't even have to think twice about modern games, Randy. Couldn't agree more. And I would actually put Rebels Romance second behind modern games. Who who would be the American champion with Goofo? I mean, who would it be? Who would, who, you know? So <laughs> it, I think it's modern games uh, to me. And a, uh, a, a, that's, a, that, that, that's a gimme to me. I was trying to look through the American turf horses, and I'm like, God, who, who, who are you going to give this to? The only one I could come up with maybe is Casa Creed. Didn't he win two grade one races this year? Casa Creed ran well, yes, uh, sprinting. Uh, Santine right, had a couple right. of uh, had, a, had a couple of, of good moments, you know, uh, on the West Coast. There were a couple of horses that that ran pretty, but. I mean, but yeah, it's modern games. Now, Warlike Goddess was the best American mile and a half turf we'll horse. Say that. We'll get to her. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, Zoe, are you on board with modern games as well? Yep. All right. I can't get any dissension out of the ranks. Okay. So now, Philly and Mayor Turf. Randy, you beat me to the punch. I think we're going to agree on this one as well. Um, again, this is where Tuesday will get some votes based on her win in the Philly and Mayor Turf for Aiden O'Brien. But again, I don't, that's just, unless it really extenuating circumstances, to me as a voter, one race in the United States, no matter how impressive it was, is not enough. And I don't give them credit for anything they did in Europe because it's not a European award, it's a US award. So Warlike Goddess, she won it to me in the Joe Herstar Classic when she beat males and, and, and you know ran so well in there. She ran fine in the Breeders' Cup, Philly and Mayor Turf. I picked her, I wish she would have won. But you know, from start to finish, just like you know we said with Epicenter, I think in her division, 
you know, she was clearly the best horse throughout the year. And again, to have the one major win against males puts her over Tuesday to me. Well, I'm all for diversity of opinion, but if there's a single voter that votes other than Warlike Goddess for champion <laughs> Philly or Mayor Turner, will be. they should revoke the voting rights of that individual for future Eclipse Awards. Off with the head. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> all right, so can we maybe get some a little bit of debate here on this one? Maybe not. Okay. Sprinter is interesting. Um, Jackie's Warrior, you, you know, had a very good year, even though the way he went out with two losses. Um, but those two losses, to me, kind of disqualified him from Eclipse competition. Not a, from competition, but maybe want to look elsewhere. Um, people are making a case for Cody's wish, but he's not a sprinter. He's a miler. I don't include mile races, even one turns as sprint races. To me, they're not sprints. So elite power. Um, you know, he wins the Bosberg. He obviously needed to win the Breeders' Cup Sprint to be able to be sprint champion. But, you know, he's a very impressive winner of the Breeders' Cup Sprint. Uh, you know, not a stellar division either. Normally, I like to see horses have won more than one grade in one race, which is all elite power has done. But uh, he gets the nod for me. Well, he had the Bosberg as well before, uh, before right, yeah. the Breeders' Cup Sprint. So, look, I know you want dissension, Bill. I know you really want me to go Stephen A. Smith or Skip Bayless <laughs> and at least manufacture dis dissension, even if I don't truly well, believe Randy, it. you can do it. But in, but in this case, look, I, I could see Jackie's Warrior last year, obviously, uh, even though Aloha West beat him. And he ran poorly in the in the with it with an excuse in the uh, in the Breeders' Cup Sprint last year at Del Mar. Yeah, I can totally see Jackie's Warrior being champion sprinter, and I voted for him. But I I can't do it this year because I I, I agree. I think Elite Power deserves to be uh, at the top of the list. Maybe Zoe's got dissension. <laughs> no, 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 no dissension. You guys are no yeah. fun. Bill, you're too good. You're too good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> and again, I tried to come up with some that were at least a little bit different because, you know, again, there are, uh, you know, uh, I tell you, if anybody votes against Flightline, then yes, they should definitely, definitely have their uh, vote uh, restricted. All right. So here's another thing I think we're all going to agree on. How is it that John Sadler is not in the Hall of Fame? Now, I think he will get into the Hall of Fame based on his work with modern, uh, excuse me, with, of course, Flightline, which was so exemplary. But look at these numbers. He's won twenty seven hundred and fifteen races. He's won 186 graded stakes races, 45 grade ones. He's won the Breeders' Cup Classic twice, the Pacific Classic four times, and the uh, San Diego Handicap three times. This should be a slam dunk into the Hall of Fame. And I don't, Randy, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't recall him even being on the ballot over the uh, at any point in time. I, 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 you know, I can tell you, first of all, it's wrong, and he, I think he will get in. The only reason I can see is he's not a factor in the Triple Crown races. And, you know, that, that is so much a priority among voters. I mean, you know, Bob Baffert, obviously well-deserved Hall of Famer, but, you know, he's going to get in first ballot because of what he's done in the Triple Crown races. But John Sadler is not a factor in the Triple Crown races, just not what he does. But he is a, a, a definite Hall of Famer. And if they don't correct this mistake this year, I, I think, you know, uh, that would be an egregious error. Yeah, I think he was going to get in anyway, eventually. And now I think Flightline sort of cements the deal. Yeah, it hurts. With some voters that he's not a factor typically in the triple crown races that'll probably change at some point um there was that long winless spell in the breeders cup that people made a big deal about before accelerate won the breeders cup classic you know can john sailor win outside of california and you know that's been obviously a, a, you know some a, a stake has been driven through the heart of that particular theory uh, so Zoe knows a lot more about him than i do I've, i cover him from a media perspective and i've talked to him quite a bit but zoe you're around him on a regular basis. Oh, he'll get in for sure. I think he's just, the attention has been sprung onto John Sadler now. Before, I'm not even sure anyone was just like, oh, he's just a trainer in California. And he doesn't venture outside of California an awful lot. And his ventures outside of California have, a lot of times he's had horses scratched on the road purely because they've got sick on the road. Like, I've been to a lot of places over the years where John Sadler shipped in a favorite for a stake and has never got to the races because he got sick on the way over. So I think now his name is out there and everybody knows John Sadler. So it, it's just a matter of time. It, John Sheriffs isn't in the Hall of Fame and look what he did with Zenyatta. Right? Is he in the Hall of Fame? He's not, right? No, he is not. No, no he's, he's not. not. But he hasn't won 2,000 races either. He hasn't even won 1,000 races and he's a very good trainer. So, I mean, a lot of people were rallying for him to be in the Hall of Fame. He's not there, but it's just a matter of time before John Sadler's in the Hall of Fame. 
Yeah, I think and you're honestly, right. I, think- I don't think he really, he's quite happy. It's not going to change his world, I don't think. He'd rather win the Derby than be in the Hall of Fame, I think. I think there are but people again, in the Hall of Fame that have less credentials than John Sadler. So I, I, I yeah, think yeah. Mark Hess is in there. He's only won one Triple Crown race. Right? But uh, I think you're right. Based on the flight line work, I think he will get in as soon as the very next election. So, uh, and uh, that will be uh, correcting an error that needs to be corrected. The TDN Rises Room is brought to you by XBTV. The XBTV workout of the week is Forbidden Kingdom, the son of American Pharaoh, working very, very nicely here for Hall of Famer Richard Mandela. Now, he's had one start since some throat surgery. That didn't go too well, but he's coming in in the best of form, seen working here under jockey Jessica Pfeiffer in 58 and change Forbidden Kingdom, the SBTV work of the week. We'll be right back after these messages from XBTV. All the thrills. Fraction of the bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life, make new friends, and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com. The TDN Rices Room is brought to you by West Point Thoroughbreds. Need we say more? Just say Flightline. That's all you need to know. And you, too, could have been part of Flightline. Go to westpointtb.com. And that's a wrap on another show. Great show. It was so much fun recapping the Breeders' Cup with you guys. I want to thank my co-host, Randy Moss, Zoe Cabin, our producer, Patty Wolf, our assistant producer, our associate producer, I should say, Katie Petruniak, our editors, Elia Laraca, Anthony Laraca, and welcome back to our mascot, Lucy. Yay, oh, Lucy. Oh, she's back. Wait, 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 wait. I want to show you where I am. That's Lucy. Do you want to see where I am? Yeah, oh, that. that's beautiful. That's, that's nice. Somerset. All the way from Somerset, England. Very good. Nice. Walk in Somerset, England. She would like that. Yeah, All she'd right. love it. <laughs> <laughs>